Hey guys, Jake Carlson here, host of the Modern Leadership Podcast. Are you ready to focus on amplifying your leadership superpowers? Let's go. Hello, my friends, and welcome to the Modern Leadership Podcast. Let me ask you, how many of you love your job? Not every part of it, but most of it. You know, you're excited to get started each day. You take the stairs two at a time. Anyone? Okay, a few of you. Now, how about the other side? How many of you do not like what you do? You dread the day, grouch at the alarm clock, and desperately want to do something else? Be honest. Recent polls show that most of you fit in this second category. You are disengaged at work, and it's hurting your career, your family, your company, and most importantly, it's hurting you. So today, I'm bringing on an expert in workplace inspiration and meaning, Danny Gutnick. Danny is the CEO and co-founder of the advisory firm Pathways, helping organizations tap into their potential through people strategies. He has worked with individuals and companies around the world, and he recently authored the book, Meaning at Work and Its Hidden Language. Danny, so great to have you with us today. How are you? I'm great. Nice to be here, Jake. Yeah, it's really fun to get you on the podcast. We were talking a little bit in the pre-intro here that what you talk about, what you write about is so relevant to what the, the listeners to this podcast want to hear. And so I'm so excited to jump into that. But before we do, did we miss anything in the intro? Anything personal, family, passions? No, not at all. <laughs> Everything is encompassed in this. I'm a writer and I founded Pathways. So let me take you back and let's talk a little bit about this Pathways company that you have and what you do and how you got into this business of finding meaning at work. You know, uh, we, we founded Pathways to change the way that people take jobs. Um, you know, myself and my partners had been in business uh, it, for a couple other companies for years, and particularly in the recruiting business. And one of the things that we found is that the, the world of jobs had just been commoditized. Um, people were looking at the, the relationship between themselves and work as just – hey, it's a fundamental exchange of time for dollars. And we wanted to change that because we had you know, spent a lot of time trying to dig under the hood with most people and find out you know, what do they really care about. And everybody does want more from their work. You spend 57% of your life there. Yeah, it's amazing that we spend so much time. And I agree with you that a lot of us are getting into this frame of mind where it's just how many hours do I need to give so that I can get enough money back to do the other stuff that I want to do. So take me back to when you're starting out and you're a recruiter and you see these people coming through the door or getting them on the telephone. And what are they? what is their plea for you at this point? Have they succumbed to the, I just am ready to change time for dollars. Can you help me find a job? Or are they asking you for meaning? Well, you know, here's – that's a great question, by the way. Um, it, it started actually even before I got into recruiting. I just never – it never occurred to me to do anything that I didn't love doing. And so w when I was a little bit younger, I'd bump into jobs or I'd try things out, and I was like, it just didn't resonate with me. So when I got into recruiting, we started to have conversations with people about jobs. And when you asked them what they really cared about, it almost took them back. Like, what do you mean? What do I, what do I care about? Well, when you're spending your day doing something, where do you lose track of time? You know, what's deeply important to you? What moves you at your core? Why did you go get that PhD in computer science or, you know, or why did you go ahead and go through school to become a doctor? And it almost startles them, but then you can actually start a real conversation about what makes sense for life. So now when you're working as a recruiter, uh, your paycheck is coming from the company, right? So a company like IBM, let's just use that as an example. So IBM would hire you as a recruiter to go out and find employees, right? So that would kind of shortcut the, the cycle for them? Yeah. So when we started Pathways, one of the things that we did is we said, to be able to change the way people take jobs, we actually have to show up differently in our business model. We can no longer put a price per head. I don't want to incentivize people to put people into a, to a role. So IBM might hire us, but they're actually hiring us to, to, make, to, to foster and build their network, to make more of an impactful match instead of, hey, just go find me this particular talent because I need this job done. And so as you're working with a company – 
And this is changing the paradigm a lot here. So the company is saying, we want our employees not just to be good at what they do, but we want them to to like what they're doing or be passionate about what they're doing because we're starting to see that there's an important, that's an important aspect of this hiring process is that if they're engaged, if they're excited, if they're enthusiastic, they're going to do better. But this didn't just happen overnight. No one flipped the light switch. So as you're going through this process, did you find that there was kind of a conflict between what the company was asking you to do and what the individuals that you were trying to place were looking for or what they thought they were looking for? Well, have you ever seen the movie Zoolander? Yes. Yeah, <laughs> where, 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 where the, uh, I think it's uh, Ben Stiller yeah. and uh, Owen Wilson go in and they say it's in the computer, right? And they, they start looking at the computer and the 2001 Space Odyssey starts playing and every, they start jumping up on the desk beating on the computer. Um, it, it, I always get that metaphor in my mind when I think about the way that people approach the, the labor force. We have this, we have these mental models that we use to be able to, you know, kind of understand our existence, which is what meaning is. It's, it's how do we interpret and how do we act out in the world? We've become so good at like this domain of resources and scalability and making, you know, kind of plugging plug and play that we forgot that humans exist. <laughs> right. And, and so when we go to a company, oftentimes we have to help them switch their mental model and say, listen, you, 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 you have this, do you have a few legs to this stool and sure it's easy to make a talent fit, but are you really making a, a, a match in the in passion and meaning? So in other words, does your organization's meaning align with this person's meaning? Because here's, here's the thing that we know. Talent doesn't create opportunity. It doesn't always take advantage of opportunity. We can look across the country, and that's not the case. But passion creates its own skills, creates its own opportunities. So how do we as employees or as job seekers, how do we display that passion? Because for years and years, we've talked about how to get our resumes right. And getting our resumes right is very objective, right? We try to put down, these are the numbers. These are the objectives we hit. And it, it's it got those hard skills on it. But how do we communicate these softer skills of passion where you say, and I agree with you, Danny, that these are so vital in the workforce today, but how do we communicate them at in a role that we're at or in a in a job that we're applying for. Yeah, that's a that's a good question. Uh, one of the things that we actually try to get our clients off of and that we we practice here at Pathways is throw the resume out the window. Um, it's nice to be able to see, you know, some of skills and what they've done with them, but unless you really have a con- a conversation about what's contextual. And so as an individual, I'm I'm more looking at what do I really care about? And when I go to focus on what I lose track of time on, and, and that usually has something to do with my skills. If you think about the way that we developed our skills and we, we stumbled into where we're at now, which is what most people say is when I ask them, why did you become this or that? It's you know about 20% of the population says, well, I knew it when I was seven, right? But today, you know, you're still running into a large portion of the population that says, I just kind of stumbled into it. That's actually a great answer. And the reason it's a great answer is because you, you want to, while some people maybe they resonate with something early on and they really want to be that and go, go chase that for part of their life, the other part that's really important is knowing what you don't want to do. Yeah. And so how do we do that? So, so there's, a, there's a, actually a Japanese concept called ikigai, and it talks about where um, your passion aligns with what you can get paid for with you know, what you're good at, you know, and there's a little kind of circle in the, in the middle. Yeah. Um, it, it, you know, for me, it's kind of simple. Most people only visit meaning when there's a death, a birth, or some traumatic event in life. A life event. Yes. They get fired or laid off. For me, it's like we spend 57% of our life at work. Why wouldn't we start paying attention and say, am what I, is what I am doing right now meaningful? And if it isn't, if it's just a drain, start moving in the direction of going towards what is meaningful. It's, you may not get there overnight. And the big lie that we 
here in society is that there's overnight successes. They're, they're, they're very few and far between, if any, right? And so you just start doing that mental exercise. There's a great model online from a guy named Bijoy Goswami. I, I, I reference a couple of his models in my book. He's a good friend of mine. We started talking about meaning. It's called the journey model. And one of the things that the journey model explains is that we have multiple meanings. We have a spiritual journey. We have a work journey. We have a relationship journey. We have parental journey sometimes, right? And if you just, if you, and so what happens is, is that when we come into existence, first 21 years of our lives, all of our mental models, all of our meaning models, which is how we're really understanding the world and what, how we're interacting with it, are inherited from our parents, from our culture. And then at some point, we, we become adults and we start start looking at different models and we go, hey, maybe I grew up Catholic, but I'm going to switch over to Buddhism now, <laughs> right? Because Catholicism isn't working, whatever that is. So somebody, they don't know that that's not the total answer for their life. That's just part of their spiritual journey. But what they'll do is they'll go, I'm going to change from this inherited meaning model to a chosen one. Well, if you if you look at like, Abraham Maslow and Carl Jung and people that studied, hey, what are the healthiest, most fulfilled people on the planet? They seem to be really successful. Whether they're famous or not, it doesn't matter, but they seem to be really successful and experience a lot of joy in their life. Well, those are the people that are self-authoring, self-actualizing, right? And so that third step in that journey model is where you're going, hey, I don't I don't actually want to take my meaning from an authority-based system. I want to actually figure out what it is for me. And the truth test for that is, what's true for me? You know, what does it resonate with me? And that's the question that I started asking a long, long time ago, which was, hey, you know, if there's something that I'm doing that isn't resonating with me, just stop doing it. And if there's something that I'm doing that resonates with me, just do more of it. Do more of that. And Danny, this really resonates with me, and I am completely in line with you. This is in line with everything that I teach and everything that I talk about on the podcast. It's all this internal, it's figuring out what you want to do. Uh, I call it the zone of genius where your expertise, a world need, and your passion kind of align and you're working and operating in that. But what I want to talk about with you is how companies are reacting to this. Because the experience that I had is as the economy in the United States crashed in 2008, 2009, 2010, the, the group of people that were most affected by that was this middle management. These people who had, you know, good education, had kind of plans, they were climbing this corporate ladder. And then right there during those three years, there was this major laying off in the middle, right? We were still hiring new entrants and we still kept our top management, but we laid off this middle group. And so as I look at these companies and I'm seeing what, I, what I'm seeing is that they're asking more of the people that are there. They're not bringing on more people. They're asking more of them, which I think is driving out our ability to follow our passion and to do more of what we feel meaning in our work. And are you seeing something different in your work? Not, not, not totally. Here's, here's what I see is a lot of domain confusion. And so I had mentioned um, that Bajoy Goswami had a couple of models that he uses to, you know, they're really just models or lenses, right? They allow us to see things from a different perspective. And, he has this model called the human fugue that that shows how we've gone undergone fundamental shifts in domains of existence in society for the last 500 years and so the first domain is actually phenomena which is just the material world or anything that we can particularly study or whether we can see it or not or you know but we we galileo you know went against something that was popular opinion at the time, which is heavier objects fall faster. And he, and he tested it. <laughs> and before that, it was like, well, who, who, who said that heavier objects fall faster? Well, the Pope, <laughs> right? <laughs> and, and so authority-based system in phenomena is just, well, whoever says so. And so over 500 years, we developed something called scientific method where we implemented a process where we could have a th- – hypothesis. We could go test that hypothesis. We could get peer review. We could end up having a, a scientific theory, gravity, you know, um, energy, whatever that is. And we've just begun perfecting it over 
50 years. And so that's great. So our second domain of existence is actually rights, human rights. And if you think about it in terms of Maslow's little triangle, these things are stair steps for society as well. And so our rights is, you know, our, our safety, our security, what do we, you know, our existence. And so 200 years ago, the founders of our country went out and said, hey, we need to develop a system where pe- the people govern. And that's actually a process, which is protest, debate, legislate, execute law. Oh, we don't like the way that right turned out. Protest it, <laughs> debate, legislate, right? And we're seeing that today, right? Absolutely. And so then the third, which is the thing that you're pointing to, and this gets to the real heart of the problem that you're talking about, is resources. 200 years ago, we instituted something for resources called capitalism. So no longer did I have to go to the local magistrate and get permission, pay people off, right, to start a business. I could see value as an entrepreneur in society, and I could say, I'm going to create a solution, I'm going to sell it. I'm going to exchange, repeat, right? Oh, I have a business model. That's, that's the process in resources. So we, we, for the last 200 years in particular, in all three of those first do- three domains, we have begun to master the heck out of them. And so what's happened is, is that you, if you think about it this way, we've become so good at them that we think the mental model that we need to use or the mentality that we approach each domain with is the right one for every, every one of those domains, right? So you got people in politics that want to use debate for, for science, (laughs) right? Right. Okay. That, that, that's actually debate. It's scientific fact is fact. Um, you've got, you've got people in capitalism that if you think about capitalism, we're really good at making money. A lot of things, a lot of times when I meet CEOs, I'm like, hey, you've become really good at meeting, making money, but you're not very good at living a life. And they're like, you know what, you're right. Yeah, out of balance. Yes. And so what we've done in, in resources is, is we've, we have scaled and perfected the heck out of this space. I mean, we're good at business models. We have business model canvases. We're good at all sorts of different things. But in the process of it, we've developed – our companies have become a little bit like machines and we're looking for cogs to fit into those machines. We're like, Oh, this one broke. Let's get another one. Right. And we're missing the fundamental equation of what's important in our companies from it. And as a result, our companies are not reaching their potential. And so here, a good example is there's a guy named R.E.D. House that studied uh, Shell, when they were having their 100th birthday, they thought, hey, we're joining great company. They went out and looked, and turns out most Fortune 500 companies don't live 40, 50 years. <laughs> and what he, what he realized is that the, the companies that lasted a long time viewed their organization as an organism, and they actually dealt with it like a network, and they kept mining who they were and their language and what was important, and it was, and it was really an evolution. And then you look at that, and you look at like a business book like Blue Ocean Strategy, where they're saying, "Hey, the companies we value most in society that we want to have exchanges with, actually, actually are unique." <laughs> and it makes a lot of sense because what are we looking for as human beings within ourselves? We're looking for what's unique. We want to be the best unique expression of ourselves, and therefore, when we go out and we, we see it in the world, we're attracted to it. Apple, Starbucks, Cliff Bar, you know, we see these big things that have, have built a unique expression of themselves. And so as consultants or as business coaches, as we go into these companies and we see that they're still following this old resources model and we see this new model emerging and it's a people model where we're letting our people really rise up and do what the best, you know, what's in their best effort and what they're passionate about. And you gave some examples of some of these companies that are doing that within their employee base. They're allowing their employees to spend time volunteering in the community or work flexible hours or do this. So as consultants and business advisors, as we go in and talk, it's on us. It's our responsibility to help move that along because eventually it's going to happen. We're going to evolve, but we can help it move along. Is that kind of what you're saying? 
So think about this. So the fourth domain, this is a, that's a great point that you're making. The fourth domain is meaning, and we're undergoing the fundamental shift today. And what's happening is, is that, you know, Carl Jung, who, who, who really did most of the groundwork in the world of meaning, um, in his book, The Undiscovered Self, says scientific, industrial, political man. Okay, that's those three areas, science. So phenomena, <laughs> business, and, and rights is suffering from the shift or the burden of meaning from the institution to the individual. It can be terrifying, and it can be incredibly empowering all at once. And so, so the, the shift that we're undergoing today is the shift in meaning. And meaning is moving from an authority-based process to a authority-based system to a process. And so if you look at, if you look at that, and you think about that on on a uh, on a you know on a deeper level, you're going, oh, this makes sense. Why people in the world today are kind of shedding off. You're looking at the NFL, right? <laughs> They're going, hey, wait a minute. You might be able to own my paycheck, but you don't own my values. People want to stand up and show their individuality, their ability to make their own decisions. They they have this uniqueness that they want to show. And I was just watching over the weekend that in Europe, in the European Soccer League, we have an, one of the teams that's now kneeling during the the not during the national anthem of the United States because they're in Europe, but they're showing solidarity. But it's their way of saying we stand for something more than just soccer players or the institution. That's that's right. What they are doing is they're expressing themselves in the domain of meaning. And so the truth test for meaning is actually, is it true for me? Right. Um, and so here's here's what's happening in companies. Companies still want to supply the meaning. And it's a burden for companies to actually supply the meaning. It, when you put your values on the wall and you tell people to align your values, you're automatically starting the employment relationship off with a lie. So I have to lie to get in here. <laughs> yeah. Right. And you have to lie to tell me that you're going to live up those to those values. And I'll, I'll tell you why that's like like it's such a wrong equation. We, we you spent what, 30 years developing your own values. <laughs> it should be you should be hired for the values that you bring to the table. On top of that, our values are contextual. If you think about that journey model, you know, hey, my values in my spiritual journey are different than my values in my parental journey or different than my values in my work journey. And so, and also as my work journey or work situation changes is that domain of resources, the market changes. I might have to have different values as a company. If you think about Southwest Airlines, they went from no frills, freedom to fly, without heart, it's just a machine, (laughs) right? They're continuing to explore who they are. And so, Organizations are only tapping a fraction of their potential because they don't have the meaning competency yet. They don't understand meaning competency. And it's actually a two-sided equation. We have to, as people working in the workforce, we have to begin to, like the NFL players, actually have the intestinal constitution or the deep constitution to go, no, I am not going to bend from who I am for this. Yeah, stand for who you are. Yeah, but once I know who I am, I can actually steward this organization better. That's what, you know, Maslow and Young found is, hey, we actually contribute more and we contribute more of our potential to the organization and to the society when when we get the sense of self. And that's that's pretty easy to see people in organizations that do well. They seem to have a a better sense of self, right? A better, more in touch with their meaning. Yeah. And I was having an interview that just came out on the podcast a couple of weeks ago that talked about this topic of each company needs to have a written vision statement. And I hear what you're saying, and I want to liken it back to this conversation I had with Scott Beeb, and that is he talks about having this written vision statement, which not only tells people that are interested in it, this is what we value, but it tells those who aren't interested in it to run from it. That this written vision allows people to run to it or run away from it so that as a qu- company, we align ourselves with your vision and your passion, you know, from a company perspective and an individual perspective so that I know if I'm going to be a good fit for you and you know if I'm going to be a good fit based on how our values align, not how well I align to your values, but how well our individual values align together. Uh, that's that's a great point. One of the things that um, – that, that 
that the book explains is I created a process called essence mining. I don't think I created it. I more discovered it. And essence mining is the process by which you go into the organization and you separate out these, these other four lines of existence. And so phenomena, you separate out and go, hey, that's things that we have to master as an organization to be successful. Um, resources, that's our business model that we have to constantly keep, keep a process going so that we can, you know, make great profits and, you know, build that thing great. We have a system of rights within the organization where I have the right to tackle this certain part of our business and you have the right to, you know, steward that part. So meaning... The essence mining model helps pull meaning out of those areas, decontaminate those lines of business, and pop it into the right context to where everybody in the organization is constantly and dynamically articulating the meaning of the organization as it goes along. And that articulation we, we, when we pull it out, we, we call it an ODLF, an Organizational Dynamic Lingua Franca. And so I had to kind of rip off some stuff from the linguists <laughs> to, try to, to try to find something to, to call it. But it, it, it came from the fact that an organization like human beings are complex. And so you have to approach the organization almost like it's the, the elephant. Um, and you're, you're eight blind people trying to tell each other what the elephant looks like. Right. And so the vision piece, vision and marketing and marketing language, marketing uses a lot of meaning in its language, but it's actually a resource based language, if that makes sense. Right. They're trying to sell you something. So meaning works different than that. Meaning isn't something that you that you abbreviate. Meaning is something I'll give you a good example. If you and I are having a conversation and you come in and you're like, hey, I'm really about innovation. And I'm like, hey, I am, too. Oftentimes we'll get up and we'll run out of the room and, um, you know, and we'll be like, hey, we agree. <laughs> and then and then we start working together and you're, you're, you're like, hey, man, I thought you were about innovation. <laughs> I'm like, I thought you were too. You don't know. And then all of a sudden it's like, you don't know what the heck you're talking about. We define it differently. It's because we didn't unpack that context with each other. We didn't go, hey, what does that mean to you? And how do you think that should be? expressed in the business place how do you how do you, how what environments have you been with that and they don't have to be the same like my values and your values around that context don't have to be the same we may find that hey the ben the business the meaning of the business benefits from our two different approaches but if we don't get that on the front end we start building in all these projections and expectations and frustrations soon follow. Well, and the foundation isn't built in a solid way. Danny, this is an amazing conversation. I look at our time, we've really ripped through it, and we haven't even dived into the five principles for inspiring meaning in the workplace. But that's okay. The listeners can get that. You wrote a blog post that we guest posted on the website. So we'll just have them go there. They can learn about these five principles. And uh, before I let you go, Danny, we want to talk about learning from leaders. We want to put a little personal with this business discussion. And we want to find out some of the things you're reading and watching. How does that sound? Sounds good. Wonderful. Okay. How about your the book currently on your bedside table or your Kindle? Behave by Richard Sapolsky. And what do you think about it? Oh, I, I, I've always loved Richard Sapolsky. I, I've watched his U, YouTube videos. He's a lecturer at Stanford, PhD. He studied primates and stress and, you know, and, and started to equate that to human behavior. And so I'm always a student of human behavior. I think it's the biggest topic in business today. Well, and I find it absolutely fascinating. Like, you know, I can sit and read about human behavior and it, to me, it's like watching a television show or, or reading a, a novel, like a fictional novel. It's just entertaining. How about the best movie ever made? You know, I'm a big fan of Full Metal Jacket. <laughs> <laughs> a first time recommended movie on the podcast. We love it. Full Metal Jacket. How about your leadership superpower? Uh... I, I don't know that I really have any superpowers. Um, I, 
I, you know, well, I'd li- I'd like to jump in here for a minute and just tell you that listening to you over the last thirty five minutes as we've gone through this podcast, you have a tremendous ability to read books, read quotes, read theories, and retain what you're reading and apply them to what you're doing. And I call that a leadership superpower. It might be under the problem solving category where you just you see solutions in what you're reading. And so, uh, if I could answer that question for you, that's how I would. But I'm not you. Yeah, deep pattern matching. I mean, I I think when you, you know, use some of the models that even we talked about, you'll develop your own superpower very quickly. Um, You'll start to you'll start to use those models and you'll start to see your own patterns and how patterns in the universe align with that. All right. Best business book ever written. Gosh, I would say probably the further reaches of human nature by Maslow. Um, He he really it, it. it's his last written work. You can't get it on Kindle. You have to get it in hard copy, but he's bouncing back and forth. It was after it was towards the end of his life and it was bouncing back and forth between him and Peter Drucker. It, the book doesn't have anything about Peter Drucker in there, but you can tell that Maslow is trying to figure out how humans work in organizations. Oh, very fascinating. Very interesting. Well, before we let you finally jump off this episode of the podcast, do you have a motivational quote or mantra? And then how can we find out more about you, get in touch with you, Danny? Yeah, absolutely. You know, one of the, one of the qu- quotes that I always keep in the back of my mind is th- that which you resist persists. It's a young quote, and basically what it means is that if you repress something, if you don't pay attention to what resonates with you or what's meaningful to you, it's going to show up in other facets of your life, oftentimes in a, in a way that you don't want it to. And so that, it, it keeps me on this journey of truth, go hit the nail on the head type of thing. You can, you can find me. Um, my personal site is essencemining.com. The best way to look me up is uh, through my company site, pathways.io. That's great. We'll we'll link all that up on the show notes to this episode. And Danny, if we could circle back full circle for this episode, we started off with you saying, look at what you're doing in your job when time really flies, when it clicks past and you don't know where the minutes went. I got to be honest with you, Danny, I'm looking at the timer right here on the computer. This has been a fascinating conversation for me. One of my favorite subjects to discuss. I think you're an absolute expert at finding meaning in work. And I thank you for joining us for this episode of the Modern Leadership Podcast. Jake, the call has been delightful. I really enjoyed the exchange. Where in the world did the time go? The time was just flying. Had a fascinating conversation with Danny. Really appreciate him coming on the show. I love talking about this. I love talking about finding meaning at work. It's so important to me. It's something that I've based my entire career on. Finding out what I love to do, the things that I'm good at, the things that really resonate with me, and doing those to the best of my ability. And then finding those things that I don't like to do and either delegating them or eliminating them from my life. You see, you don't always have to change jobs. You don't have to change careers. You can find meaning in your current work if you start this process of identifying what is important to you and start to eliminate those things that really just don't resonate with you. Now, guess what? Work is work. Sometimes and often, you're going to have to do things that aren't your most favorite. You know, but if most days you're excited and most things that you're doing really resonate with you, I think you're on the right path. As I was hanging up with Danny, we got to talking and I said, look, I'm going to take you up on that coffee visit. We're going to sit down and we're going to continue this conversation because I love this conversation of finding meaning in your work. I had big plans on this episode to go into the five principles of finding meaning in the workplace, clarify the dialogue, examine individual contribution, embed questions around meaning, encourage individual excellence, connect to an underlying humanity. And I wanted to dive into each of those, but we didn't get that chance. And that's okay because Danny came and did a guest blog post for the blog. It came out two days ago. Just head over to jakeacarlson.com and you can find that there. All the show notes, everything we talked about, including a link to that blog post, will be found at jakeacarlson.com slash ML44, Modern Leadership 44. And again, thanks for spending this time with me. I want to wish you the best of days and even better life and stay awesome. (laughs) 
Thanks for listening to the Modern Leadership Podcast. You can find me on Facebook at Speaker Jake, on Twitter at Jake A. Carlson, and of course the website, jakeacarlson.com. See you there.